Uh, let me just make the usual. This is where I talk and you guys don't talk anymore, Brianna. Thank you, hon. Um, so uh, a few of the usual administrative announcements. Uh, one, remember to throw away your trash after lunch. Number two, remember to recycle cans and bottles. And number three, uh, please remember to turn off your cell phones. Um, and if you're taking the course associated with the brown bag, the, the sign-up sheet is right where he is standing signing. Um, next week's speaker is going to be uh, David Joyner, our own David Joyner. Um, and I am going to turn things over to Alex now. Where do you go? To uh, introduce today's speaker. All right, uh, yeah, so today's speaker is Bill Pike. Uh, he's gonna talk to us a little bit about uh, linking uh, human and machine discovery for interactive streaming analytics at scale. Uh, Bill Pike is the uh, division, division director of the Computational and Statistics Analytics Division uh, at a national lab called the Pacific Northwest National Lab, or PNNL. Uh, they, they do quite a bit of visual analytics and data science related work. Uh, and so the talk you're gonna hear is a little bit about that. Uh, for those of you who know me, uh, also know that this is the, the place where I worked for several years before coming to uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, so it's really a pleasure to have uh, Bill Pike back here at Georgia Tech to tell us a little bit about uh, some of the things that he's doing uh, both at the division level, but also sort of more at the, the research level of uh, visual analytics. So please join me in welcoming uh, Bill Pike to Georgia Tech. Thanks, uh, thanks, Alex, and thank you all for uh, for having me here. I'm really excited to to be here and share with you some of the work that uh, that we're doing. Um, we've had a long history of collaboration with folks at Georgia Tech for I don't know a decade plus, uh, more than that. Um, so it's it's uh, it's great to, to be back here uh, to share with you some of the things that we're doing, but more importantly, uh, to hear from you uh, over uh, other discussions today and tomorrow about some of the things that you're all working on uh, and ways that we can uh, we can solve some some interesting problems together. Uh, as Alex mentioned, uh, I lead a computing division at, at PNNL. PNNL is one of uh, 17 national laboratories in the, in the US. Uh, we're basically the, the federal government's advanced R&D arm. So when uh, the government has big, hard scientific problems, uh, power grid problems, security problems, they come to a national lab like ours for help solving them. Uh, and we like to kind of position ourselves as, uh, as both a basic research institution, but also as uh, a research institution that's fundamentally motivated by, uh, by solving some really critical um, scientific and technical challenges for, uh, for the nation. Um, so I could spend uh, an hour talking about all the kinds of work that we're doing. I, I, I chose instead to focus on one particular area, uh, which is where we're making some, some big bets. Uh, essentially a, a fundamental investment about the future of analytics and the future of data-driven discovery, which is all about uh, a better blending between human-driven discovery and machine-driven discovery than we've been able to build to date. A lot of the really hard problems that we're working on as a nation uh, require complex human judgment. They require uh, people with a huge amount of background knowledge and expertise. They often require um, uh, moral and ethical decisions that only humans can really make well. But they also require a lot of data. And that data often arrives at speeds that vastly exceed uh, the powers of, of human judgment. So we're making a lot of internal investments to try to experiment with how we blend machine learning and data-driven discovery with human analysis, with visualization, and so on. So I'm going to focus on, on one particular investment that we're making. It uh, links together a lot of the things that you, uh, you guys are working on as well uh, to, try to, uh, to try to develop a new model for, uh, for how to solve really high-volume streaming analysis problems. Uh, just a quick word of, of background uh, about PNNL for those of you who aren't familiar. We're in uh, the eastern part of Washington State, right along the, the Columbia River. This is uh, our, our main campus. We also have an office in Seattle, uh, about 100 or so folks. Um, there are about 4,500 or so people, uh, researchers at, at PNNL. Uh, I lead a computing division of about 300 or so folks, and those 300 people, 300 researchers are focused in visualization and HCI and data science uh, and statistics and, uh, and math in software engineering and in cybersecurity. Uh, we have 100 or so of those folks uh, at our office in Seattle, in South Lake Union, uh, across the street from Amazon, across the street from Facebook, and we share a lot of uh, research collaborations uh, increasingly with, uh, with the Seattle tech community uh, as a result. Um, as, as a lab, our, our mission really is to uh, understand and control complex adaptive systems. Uh, things like uh, earth systems, uh, the climate, uh, the water cycle. Uh, energy systems uh, like the power grid and how we integrate uh, advanced renewable sources of energy into the grid. Uh, and security systems, uh, understanding uh, proliferation networks, uh, the trafficking of, of uh, illicit materials, trafficking of people, uh, and data-driven discovery for security applications like in, uh, in cyber or others. 
as a, as a computing organization, I mentioned the sort of five main, uh, main focus areas that we have, uh, but we draw expertise from uh, across computing disciplines, as I mentioned, math and stats for what we call signature construction. We're always interested in finding really novel signatures for phenomena that we care about. Uh, one of the best ones recently was uh, someone who discovered that you could, you could infer something about uh, American military planning by paying attention through overhead imagery to the number of pizza deliveries to the Pentagon. Um, so we always have folks who are focused on coming up with novel ways to identify uh, indicators for phenomena of interest. And that's, that's where, where a lot of our fundamental stats and math work is focused. A lot of work in data intensive computing and high performance computing uh, focus primarily on how do we model advanced computing architectures, power, performance, and reliability. And modeling something like a high performance computing system is not all that different from modeling uh, a distributed computing network uh, uh, like a system of UAVs in terms of building uh, computing infrastructures that are, are highly reliable, they're power efficient, and so on. Uh, we've always had a big strength in visualization. That's where a lot of our collaboration with Georgia Tech uh, emerged, uh, both in visual design, but also in algorithms to, uh, to link machine learning techniques with, uh, with visual displays. Um, Cybersecurity also has been an increasing focus of ours, but 80 or 90 or so researchers now focused on things like uh, uh, asymmetric resilient cybersecurity. How do we architect uh, computer networks to be um, uh, adaptively respond to the activities of adversaries, be able to accomplish moving target defenses that um, move resources around your network seamlessly uh, with, uh, with a high degree of automation. Uh, and critically though, this, this fourth bullet is, is kind of links together everything that we do, which is also a strong focus on people and on analytic methods and recognizing that all of the work that we do ultimately hinges on the expertise of smart analysts, of smart decision makers or policy makers. Uh, and we can do a lot of things to help those people with advanced technology and we can do a lot of things to hurt them in terms of uh, supporting uh, them in making poor decisions, in, uh, in, in um, supporting their assumptions or biases uh, unchallenged. And a lot of the work that we're doing really is focused on how to leverage the best of, uh, of human expertise in computing environments and counteract or mitigate some of the worst. Uh, and I'll close with an example actually of, of how we're starting to do that, how we're trying to learn about human behavior and human frailty in analytic systems um, and, uh, and help people counteract those. Uh, so before I dive into this, this particular example in streaming analytics, I thought I'd just give a few examples of, uh, of what we do. I mentioned there's 300 or so uh, computer scientists in our, in our computing division. Uh, there's probably 300 or so projects that we're all working on that span the spectrum across those, uh, those areas. Uh, we do everything from, uh, we're actually the lab that, that uh, invented the millimeter wave scanning imagery uh, that, you, that you go through in the airport. Uh, some people have turned, have inside the lab called the PNL salute, which is the hand, uh, two hands over the head. Um, uh, so we do a lot of hardware development, a lot of sensor development, but also a lot of analytics. Uh, now that we're able to collect, say, millimeter wave imagery, uh, we can see through things. You can see through walls. You can see through people. Uh, what do you do? Uh, how do you build analytic techniques that allow us to do a machine vision uh, over these new data streams? Um, we do a lot of work in collaborative sense making. So taking data streams like uh, data from every port of entry, all this millimeter wave scanning Im imagery, for instance, uh, and putting analysts in front of it to find patterns and trends. Uh, so a lot of collaborative visualization systems. Uh, we do a lot of work in text analysis, uh, increasingly focused on social media for indicators of, of, uh, of political disruption, of social change, uh, for biosurveillance applications. Uh, it's a very large program that a lot of our sponsors and government use for things like emergency management and paying attention to what's going on on the ground through, uh, through social media. Uh, a lot of work in, in biosurveillance, uh, linking together uh, disease spread models uh, with, uh, with open source media, like from, from social sources or others, uh, to help develop early indicators for biological events around the world. And again, building visualization systems that folks in our government use uh, to stay on top of those data and make effective decisions. Uh, we do a lot of work uh, as a multidisciplinary laboratory in bringing techniques from one domain into another. Uh, we've worked with a lot of our biologists to learn how to be better at securing computer networks with techniques from biology. So taking high performance uh, bioinformatics tools that we use for proteomics and genomics and applying those uh, to cybersecurity to identify um, malware. Um, we do a lot of work in image and computer vision. Uh, tools to allow analysts to visually understand very large collections of multimedia and find patterns between uh, text, image, audio, and so on. Uh, so just kind of a sampling of the, the kinds of things that we work on. Uh, but all of this work really centers on fundamentally the problem of data-driven discovery. And the other key thing about almost all of this work, uh, and, and I, would, I would hazard to, to say the majority of the data-driven discovery work that goes on in the analytics field today, is that uh, it's largely based on human exploration of, uh, of large data sets. Um, and it's largely based around uh, kind of forensic analysis of data at rest. 
So some challenges in that approach, and, and most of you probably have this uh, XKCD cartoon on your, uh, on your doors, at least I haven't been at a, in a computing lab where I haven't found one person who, who has this cartoon. Um, but, but it kind of points at a fundamental change in how we discover stuff about the world. Uh, through most of scientific history, uh, we developed hypotheses first. Uh, we developed theories, we developed hypotheses to test those theories, we built models, we selected methods that we could use. Um, that would allow us to perform those tests. We thought about the data that we would need in order to, uh, uh, to test those hypotheses. We'd go collect that data, uh, and, uh, and we'd show some causal relationship. Uh, we've changed that paradigm completely in the last 20 or so years, where we typically start with interesting data. And I've never actually asked this question at something like IEEE VAST, but how many of you, when you're presenting papers, you know, what the, the initial question that came, or the initial impetus for doing the work, just came because you found some cool data and said, what can I do with this? What tool can I build? What questions can I start to answer? Um, that's turned out to be a legitimate way of, of doing science. Uh, we start with interesting data that maybe has landed in our laps, that we've collected from somewhere else. Um, and we start to find correlations in that. We build lots of visual tools that simply are, are correlation engines or correlation aids. Through those correlations and patterns, we start to maybe propose some candidate hypotheses. Um, maybe we try to build some models to explain why that correlation is in spurious. Maybe our model is just a screenshot of a visualization tool and we leave it at that. And we test if we can, but you know something, tests, uh, tests for statistical validity often, often uh, aren't even required. We can do a lot of science just with some really nice uh, correlation. The problem is um, that, that while correlation is, is great at finding non-obvious patterns, um, human abilities to find uh, complex correlations in, in high-dimensional data are, uh, are quite limited. Um, and it's, it's almost unfortunate that a lot of problems actually have a sort of satisfying correlation solution. Product recommendations and something like Amazon are probably a great example. I don't need to know anything about you or anything about the world if I have enough data to build a productive correlation that might suggest a product purpose, a product purchase activity. Uh, so a lot of those, those, those uh, data-driven discovery problems, causality is kind of overrated. Um, but for the purposes of explanation, for scientific discovery, for really making decisions about the world, for understanding, uh, understanding chemistry, for understanding biology, for engineering organisms, for engineering systems, for presenting secure, or preventing security threats, causality is still kind of the gold standard for actually uh, changing the world, and causality is really, really hard. And causality typically doesn't come from the data that we collect. Causality typically comes from the human knowledge that uh, experts analyzing that data can apply. So actual discovery still depends largely on, on human expertise. It's prior experience, it's rules of thumb, it's knowledge about the world, it's the kind of semantic consistency that humans can apply. And again, as I've seen some of the great viz tools that some of your students are working on this morning, uh, looking at patterns, I can start to explain what's going on in the world that the data uh, never, uh, never could. Um, the challenge, though, is in a lot of really, really hard problems, uh, there's just simply not good training data. Uh, E-commerce is a great example of, uh, of a maybe not so hard problem, it has tons and tons of training data. There are other cases though, like scientific discovery. I am trying to engineer a fundamentally new energy storage material. I'm integrating um, uh, wind energy into the grid on a massive scale and there's a problem with wind that I don't have with coal or with water or anything else, which is I can't store it. Uh, so my challenge is if I want to, if I want to build out wind energy, renewable energy sources, I got to also have a way of storing wind in a way I couldn't, I can store coal or I can store oil. So I'm going to build batteries. I need massive batteries to store that power. So I'm going to engineer fundamental new battery materials. To discover a new material though, I can't build a classifier to find that material and data, because I don't even know what I'm looking for. If I, if I could describe the material I wanted uh, and build a class to go find it, that would have presumed the thing had already been invented, it already exists. Um, the same is true with security threats, and the example I often give is the, the, the poor, ill-fated underwear bomber, which you know, one threat vector, uh, one attempt to do something malicious, used uh, a particular a particular style of packaging explosive, they're also guaranteed to never see again because it was caught and whatever the adversary does next is going to have some different evolution on that. So I can build a classifier to find that one event, uh, but I only have one. Um, and usually one training example is not enough to build a reliable classifier. And, and uh, among our 300 or so amazing staff at PNL are about 50 or so great machine learning people and their default answer to every hard classification problem is give me a million labeled cases and I will build a classifier to solve your problem. Uh, and we increasingly come up against problems where we don't have a million labeled cases. We might have zero labeled cases. All of the labeling is in people's heads. 
Uh, so human appreciation of, of, uh, of, of, of this data, human appreciation of the purposes of defining causality comes from all the contexts that live inside our, our heads. Almost like the, just the feelings and the emotions and the memories that, that it arouses in us. And, and Netflix had this problem too. So Netflix, up until very recently, the gold standard for Netflix recommendations was the, was the star system, right? There's no, there's no e-commerce problem you can't solve with, 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 with a five-star rating scheme. Uh, unfortunately, what you realize, Netflix actually, right, they had a Netflix challenge to uh, uh, see who could improve uh, the, the, the accuracy of those ratings. What they discovered was that, that although they could come up with a measurable improvement in a predicted rating for a user, knowing that a movie was going to be uh, a 3.8, I might rate it a 3.8 instead of a 3.2, doesn't actually mean anything, doesn't actually drive whether or not I'm likely to watch that movie. My mood tonight, I'm not going to sit down with my wife on the sofa after a long day and say I'm really in the mood for a 3.8. <laughs> you know, Monday, Tuesday, I'll go with 3.2s or 3.1s, but this, is, this feels like a 3.8. No, I'm going to sit down and say, I'm interested in, uh, I want to I watch a documentary, a fight the system documentary. I'm in that kind of mood. I want a I period piece. So Netflix moved to this model where they actually threw out most of the winning algorithms, except for, I think, restricted Boltzmann machines and, and one other, in their, in their Netflix challenge and moved to a model where they had people generate these microgenres. I think there's like 80,000 Netflix microgenres they use. And they're, they're, they're phenomenally specific, foreign satanic stories from the 1980s, right? So things that only, only people could produce. And they crowdsourced this whether by, by hiring a bunch of people to watch movies. They had a tagging system. We're going to tag every movie with dozens of properties so we can generate these, these micro-genres. And these start to have some meaning to people. Now when I'm browsing for movies with my wife, I can, I can start to feel uh, what I'm in the mood for. Um, and so Netflix, like a lot of other uh, big data organizations, realizes that you have to get at some of these underlying human preferences um, in order to really start to understand causality. Correlation in making a movie recommendation isn't all that useful if it's correlating something to the, uh, to the wrong mood. And since it doesn't know my mood, uh, that correlation uh, can't be very effective. But um, trying to do something to provide human meaning, human sensibility to this data, uh, embedding uh, those recommendations in some, some sociolinguistic structures or some cultural context really helps me uh, understand the data and the recommendations much better. Um, but it gets a little bit worse. Uh, in fact, it gets worse because most of the phenomena that we want to solve, uh, that we want to we study, continuously evolve themselves. Uh, we're doing live scientific experiments. We're studying how organisms grow and change, or materials grow and change in that energy storage example. We're studying social phenomena. We're studying disease or social unrest in the Middle East. Uh, all of those things continually evolve. Um, <laughs> We, uh, we often artificially discretize the phenomenon just to put it into a batch data set that we can analyze with, a, with an offline sort of tool. But fundamentally, most of the advancement that we've made in data-driven discovery over the last 20 years has been with data at rest. The world keeps changing underneath that data, and we just often will conveniently ignore it, or we'll artificially discretize the problem so that we can study uh, that continuously evolving uh, phenomena in, uh, in a batch mode. Um, so really what we need, and where, where we're making uh, a central focus in our analytics activity as a laboratory is, is in the linkage of, of, of these three things. We recognize that for big data, for streaming data, we need techniques like statistical data mining. Uh, and we need advanced AI techniques to come out of the symbolic reasoning world. But we also need human computer interaction to help us get at those sort of Netflix flavored uh, cultural and contextual cues. Uh, so the rest of the, the time I had with you, I wanted to walk through some specific research that we're doing. It's at the intersection of these three areas, and really experimenting with blending these three uh, technical areas in new ways uh, to try to discover how much faster we can get at driving discovery from, from high volume streams in contexts where we can't simply build a classifier because we don't have all the world knowledge documented already. Um, so in a lot of cases, we, 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 just, we, we paralyze the problem with people. This is, this is actually the trading floor, uh, the UBS trading floor in, in Connecticut. The financial service industry is probably the only industry in the world that can afford to paralyze problems with people. Um, yeah. uh, most of us, whether we're doing scientific discovery, threat discovery, whatever else, can't afford just, just to throw uh, 30,000 smart brains uh, at, at the problem. But actually, what a lot of these folks are doing, they're actually algorithmic traders. They're actually steering trading algorithms. Uh, and what the financial services world has recognized is that in order to keep up with the pace of change, trading decisions have to be made by systems. But people have to observe the global patterns that those trading algorithms are making in order to tune them and refine them and respond to things that the algorithm can't quite tell, like sentiment or mood. Um, 
So we're trying to take a cue out of some of this kind of human in the loop control by answering four key questions. And so the research I'll share with you uh, this morning focuses on, on, on trying to answer these four key questions. And actually, I, I made the decision to share with you some early work. So this is, we're about a year, year and a half into this investment. Um, and part of the reason I'm interested in, in sharing this with you at this stage is we're also actively looking for people who want to uh, work on this journey with us and, and who are doing similar work uh, to identify new collaboration. So there are four questions that we're interested in answering. So, so one of them, as I've mentioned already, is this challenge of rebalancing effort between humans and machines. Um, the second, though, and how we do that is to think about how we automate the process of generating and testing hypotheses. That's what people are doing when they're interacting with data, typically. Uh, they're generating hypotheses. The problem is we're not able to do it uh, at a rate that approaches that of the, the, the rapidly changing phenomenon. So we're trying to develop new techniques to generate hypotheses. Um, but we need to present those to people in a meaningful way. How, do I, how does a machine tell a story to you as a human analyst? Uh, what does that story look like? Is it visualization? Is it machine-generated text? Uh, what does a hypothesis look like? I know how to visualize data. I don't quite know how to visualize hypotheses. In cases where I have more data than I can reasonably present to you, how do I help you visualize more abstract semantic structures? Recognizing, third, that people are critical to this whole process. Um, how do I capture human insight in situ as another data stream? So again, in the e-commerce world, we capture that human insight in a pretty simple sort of way. I pay attention to product purchase decisions or movie watching decisions. I pay attention to page views. Um, and I have a nice sort of binary success metric for a classifier. Did you watch the movie or not? Did you buy the thing or not? Uh, in the scientific discovery world, we don't quite have that same binary success metric. So how do I know if a hypothesis that the system generated was actually useful to you, actually helped you discover something new? So how do we get that much more rich semantic uh, feedback from uh, from users. And then thirdly, if we can, or fourthly, if we can do all of those things, we also feel that we can open up a fundamentally new way of doing data-driven discovery, which is actually driving data collection itself. As we're creating emerging hypotheses uh, live from data, we're also able then to, uh, to realize where we have gaps or uncertainties and steer a collections infrastructure. So we're starting to experiment with this in some of our chemistry labs. I'll, I'll give you an example in a bit where we're actually wiring some of these reasoning systems up to experimental platforms, changing the experiment in situ, heating an organism up, or cooling it down or changing where we look in a sample in response to some of these emerging hypotheses to try to collect better data to confirm or refute them. So I'm going to walk through something that we're calling analysis in motion, AIM. And AIM is basically an approach for deriving insight from dynamic data, uh, tracking a very high throughput stream or set of streams in real time, but using human input to guide computational models for making sense of that stream. So basically what we're building uh, is a multi-classifier system. Uh, but it's not a question answering system, it's not a search system, it's a discovery system. So a lot of the, the prior art in building these sort of streaming analytic systems uh, it solves challenges like search. Uh, and even a question answering system like, like Watson kind of reduces to a, to a search system. Uh, we're working kind of in, a, in uh, an opposite sort of modality where we're not trying to find uh, existing answers to newly posed questions. We're trying to define questions themselves. Uh, so that means we're, we're integrating lots of different model types. Uh, we're working with a family of about 100 different modeling algorithms at this point, from symbolic models, neural nets, probabilistic graphical models, textual models, uh, integrating all these into an, uh, a single modeling framework and then using uh, human feedback in some interesting ways to steer, uh, steer those models. And so there are four main components to how the system comes together. I'm going to walk through each of these in a, in a little while and just talk about some of the research we're doing, some of the open opportunities, and hopefully get some of your feedback uh, on these as well. Uh, so first, we're doing streaming data characterization, uh, a family of algorithms to extract features and patterns from, from data uh, in a stream. Uh, second is a, a family of stream processing algorithms, uh, hypothesis generation algorithms that are proposing uh, possible correlations, uh, that are proposing patterns, and presenting those to, uh, to humans. Uh, humans are organizing those, they're ranking them, they're providing some feedback, uh, and hopefully they're generating some insight. I'm actually tracking the production of that insight with some new cognitive science work so that we're able to feed results through user actions back to those underlying modeling, uh, modeling algorithms. I'll give you some examples of, of how we're doing that in a, in a second. Uh, when you work in a streaming mode, though, you've got you to deal with a couple of situations. So one is that you're going to have to forget data. We can't remember everything uh, that might be important to a circumstance. So um, this problem of, of machine-driven forgetfulness or machine forgetfulness is, is, a, is a challenging one. Uh, we're typically working in single-pass uh, single mode, meaning uh, once data has streamed past a sensor, I've got to make a decision about whether I can store it or not. And if I can't, I'm not going to be allowed to go back. Uh, I can't remeasure. Um, 
I can't see something that I chose to unsee the first time. Uh, but thirdly, what's crucial for us is that we have a cooperative user. We're not playing Jeopardy, where we're competing against people. We actually have cooperative people, humans who do the kind of work that we're trying to build systems to emulate that we can ask for help. Uh, but we don't have to ask them explicitly for help. We can observe how a lot of those people work and try to gain problem knowledge, gain world knowledge uh, from those people by how we tie them into this, uh, this system. Um, I've mentioned a little bit of some of the domains you work in. Just, just a, two quick examples. I'll give you a demo in a, in a minute um, about why we're, we're taking this approach. So uh, we work as a multi-program lab across lots of different scientific disciplines. Uh, we're building bioreactors. A bioreactor is basically a, a vessel like this in the upper right where you can, you can grow stuff. You can grow tissues. You can do uh, uh, bioreactions for building pharmaceuticals, for bio waste treatment, for, uh, for biofuels generation. Uh, the problem is we need to control those reactions because they're adaptive systems and all sorts of parameters guide how successfully that set of reactions uh, performs. We don't want to just stuff stuff into the vessel, close the door, press a button, go away for an hour and cross our fingers and hope that, that uh, the things worked. There's a lot of real-time manipulation that we need to do. So we need streaming analytic systems that can tell us what's going on uh, in this production activity as it occurs. Uh, from a security perspective, we're interested in things like avoiding strategic surprise. When stuff happens in the world, we'd like to know about it. We'd like to have early indicators uh, before it happens. Uh, so we're applying some of these techniques to, uh, to discovering early indicators of trafficking activity, trafficking in illicit materials, human trafficking, drug trafficking, and so on. Finding patterns of relationships and networks, uh, from shipping records to financial transactions to communications uh, uh, records that help identify early indicators of shifts in behavior that might indicate these sort of trafficking activities. So let me give you two quick examples of, of how these work in practice, and then I'll go through a bit more of, uh, oops, a bit more of a technical discussion about how this is uh, actually, there we go. So you want an example of, uh, of, of, of how these systems work, and I'll, I'll show you the, the, the demo first, and then we'll kind of dig a little more deeply technically into, into how this all runs. Um, so in that, in that strategic surprise use case, we're, we're tapping into massive data streams on shipping records, financial transactions, and so on. And we're trying to understand surprising changes. So this, this, this demo is actually just based on some open data. We're paying attention to shifts in the line of business for a company. We want to know when a particular actor in a network who typically trades in one kind of material starts to trade in another. So for this example, we're talking about some big, gross, uh, easy, open examples. These are auto manufacturers, for instance. Um, what we're trying to demonstrate for users, though, is, is hypotheses. In this case, a hypothesis is the line of business that a company is, uh, or that a person is, is trading in. Uh, so those hypotheses are, are shown here in the, on the, this chart, the uh, main chart, uh, labeled on the, on the right-hand side, uh, with simple categories, like the system believes this company's trading in appliances or in clothing and automotives. And there's, there's millions of these, of these classes. Um, as data stream in from customs records, from cargo containers moving back and forth uh, between US ports, let me uh, speed the uh, uh, speed this up a little bit. Um, we'll start to see the system make hypotheses about what a company is doing. So here we're paying attention to everything that Toyota is moving around the world. Uh, and right now, uh, the system believes the most likely hypothesis for what Toyota is doing is it's behaving like an automotive manufacturer. But some of these other things are suggesting that um, it's behaving kind of like a superstore. It's shipping around the same kind of stuff that Walmart ships around. Um, and you'll see there are brief moments in time when Toyota looked, uh, I'll just pause it here for a second, when Toyota looked mostly like an appliance company. Um, and this is, again, based on the system's uh, a belief about uh, how the pattern of activity that, uh, that Toyota is engaged in aligns with, uh, with uh, its world knowledge. Um, how this plays out under the hood, let me skip ahead a little bit. Um, so we also build a knowledge graph. So underneath this, uh, and I'll dive into the, te the technical detail of how this is all built in a second, um, we're trying to build these hypotheses for what a company is doing. Uh, we need to expose some of the rationale behind that to users. So if we're saying, you know, Toyota's starting to look a little bit like an appliance, or uh, an appliance company. They're shipping around things that don't seem to align with what we see companies who, who build cars do. We're explaining some of that to, uh, to users. So uh, under the hood, there's a knowledge graph constantly being built uh, that's expressing uh, the nature of, uh, of the, the, the sectors, the lines of business that a company is, uh, is operating in. Uh, it's giving us examples of the kinds of, uh, kinds of trades that a company is making. Um, 
in this case, I'll, I'll talk again about some of these algorithms, but, uh, but one algorithm, this is during the brief period of time when we thought Toyota was doing something odd, looking like an appliance company, and it's because they're, they're shipping now some things we typically see going into washing machines and dishwashers, aluminum plates and uh, sheets and strips over two millimeters thick. Uh, and we're building some, uh, some supporting evidence from Knowledge Graph. We're saying we found other appliance companies, Electrolux, that ship the exact same sets of things. Um, so all of this built from live streaming data where the system is trying to suggest to the user what Toyota is doing. Now note that we're not presenting uh, a visualization of all of the raw shipping data that Toyota's, that Toyota's moving around, we're simply presenting these hypotheses. Uh, and we can drill into those hypotheses, like Toyota is an appliance manufacturer, to under, uncover some of, uh, some of the raw data. Let me give you one other quick example before we dive into how, how, this, is all, uh, how this is all built. Um, another example of, of how this works is in, in this bioreactor case, where essentially what we're doing is we're putting goop into a, into a reactor, uh, and we're pressing go, and we're sticking some probes into that goop. This is, I'm not a biologist, so I, uh, it's, uh, we're sticking some probes into that, uh, into that reactor, and we're trying to measure the relative abundance of, of chemicals uh, in this reactor, um, and then trying to make a guess about what, substance, uh, what substances are, uh, are, uh, are being created. So how, how these systems work is sort of similar like, uh, like this trading data that we're using in the Toyota case, um, which is really high volume streams of data coming off of these, uh, these, uh, these biological sensors. In this case, we're repeatedly scanning over the same material, this material in the, in the reactor. Uh, so along the top row there are, are all the substances that might be in this. Uh, if you've ever taken a drug test, these are actually all the things you find in urine. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and the system is repeatedly scanning over this material. Why, why, uh, why biologists were creating synthetic urine, I, I'll leave as an exercise for, uh, for you guys. But uh, repeatedly scanning over this, this, uh, this sample and making some assumptions about, uh, making some, some assessment about what compounds we think are in there, the relative abundance and the, the, the probability of existence. So probability is, uh, is the color ramp uh, from light blue to dark. Relative abundance of, of each of these compounds is... Uh, the, uh, the size of, uh, of the glyph. And essentially, repeatedly making these scans, they end up looking like spectra. That's basically the peaks that correspond to each, uh, each compound. And the system's scanning over this. And at a certain point, when it reaches enough, you'll see enough scans, it's going to make some, some guesses. It'll show up in this compound history view about the stuff that we've just built. And it's going to be doing that by combining measurements from, uh, from this reactor with some prior world knowledge the system has learned from, from biology textbooks, from mining Wikipedia, about relationships between these chemicals. And it's going to start to suggest to the user uh, uh, some, uh, some substances that, uh, that might exist inside, uh, inside this reactor. Uh, so we're trying to reveal now some of the core uh, uh, spectra that describes the most likely behavior of this, uh, this biological substance. Let me skip ahead here a little bit. Um, I mean, we should get down to the, the, the raw compound history itself, which is essentially going to, going to flag a couple of these compounds and say, well, if you have these three things in this abundance, which appears most likely you do, you've most likely made this material. Uh, and so uh, that suggestion to the user is, uh, is a candidate hypothesis about what's going on in this very large stream. And it's aiding the, uh, the discovery, uh, discovery process. Let's see if I can jump to that point. Uh, so this compound history graph then starts to evolve, and actually the, the labeling here didn't show up on my screencast, essentially showing the relative likelihood of certain kinds of compounds uh, that I can use essentially to stop the experiments. Okay, I've built the thing I've tried to build, I've created the organism or the created the tissue I've tried to, tried to create, or conversely, I'm seeing things I didn't expect to see. And actually that's almost as useful from a scientific discovery point of view. Um, because I'm starting to find perhaps new patterns in data that don't align with any of the, the knowledge that I've, I've learned previously. Um, so I'll come back to those examples uh, in, a, in a bit. I want to just walk through a little bit about how, this, uh, how these sort of streaming human-in-the-loop uh, systems actually get built. So there are... Get focused back here, maybe. There we go. Um, so there's this general pipeline that, uh, that we're architecting for how you do human loop streaming analytics. And there are basically seven, uh, seven specific kinds of, of technical challenge you have to solve. And I'll give you maybe one slide each on, on each of these. Uh, so the first is streaming data analysis problem is how do I take really high volumes of data? In some of these bioreactor cases, we're going to be getting like a terabyte a second of data coming off of, off of the sensor. In some of our uh, microscopy work, we might be getting uh, a million frames a second of imagery, something we can't even write. That. There's no bus that we can use to write that to disk. Uh, so you've got to do some in-stream analysis. Um, so things like compressive analysis to find features in that data, or scalable feature extraction to figure out how we sample that data appropriately. From all of those sampled or compressed features, we then feed them to a set of hypothesis generation algorithms. And so we're doing both statistical machine learning and symbolic reasoning over these, uh, these, uh, 
uh, these, these extracted features. And one reason for this is that we recognize there's no single machine learning algorithm, there's no single AI technique that will universally uh, analyze data well in all domains and all tasks for all sorts of data. Rather, what we're building, kind of like, uh, kind of like IBM Watson uh, work, is just a family of algorithms. Watson's a family of question answering algorithms, and the magic there is just in ranking them and figuring out which ones perform well under which circumstances. We're doing something similar with these sort of discovery engines. Uh, and then the cool part is about how you embed people in this. So then, after we're generating all these hypotheses from, from streaming statistical algorithms, from AI, how are we visualizing those? So we're presenting those emerging hypotheses to humans, we're learning from those human interactions, and crucially, we're also paying attention to human behavior. So we recognize that humans, unlike the machine systems we're building, uh, get tired, they make unpredictable errors, uh, they have differential expertise in different domains, and we can't treat all humans who perform analysis in a domain as equal. Uh, so we have to differentially weight the feedback that humans provide uh, based on the expertise, uh, based on their, uh, how fresh they are, simply based on our assessment of their performance. If I'm, uh, I'm preoccupied today because something crappy happened on the way to work and I'm not doing my job very well, the system might like to learn that and not weight my input quite as heavily as someone who might be performing optimally. Uh, I'm going to skip through a couple, of, uh, a couple of these seven areas briefly, to just so I can spend a little bit more time highlighting others. Uh, but I want to walk through the whole pipeline, largely so you can sort of see where some of the space of opportunity is. And, and we've deliberately chosen ourselves this challenge of building the end-to-end -end pipeline, um, because we like to ultimately build this, uh, this discovery engine, a machine that will, that will create uh, stories from data, machine understandable stories, excuse me, human understandable stories from data. Uh, so in that first phase of the process, we're working fundamentally in some new compression algorithms. So techniques repurposing things like MP4 compression, which are great for compressing video, uh, and applying those to non-video streams, which we can use to identify events in data. Uh, and simply passing those events on to a downstream classifier uh, can be a nice way of, uh, of communicating the key features in an evolving system, in a bioreaction, for instance, without having to pass the entire uh, raw data set. And so we've had some interesting results. The example shown here actually was we were experimenting with building a new battery material, and it was failing. You know, cracks would form in the lithium ion material. And we didn't understand what properties were causing those to, uh, to crack. And we learned through some, some of this compressive analysis techniques, we can identify the first point of failure uh, in, those, uh, in those materials much more, quicker, uh, much more quickly uh, than, than humans or, uh, or current machine vision algorithms, uh, algorithms could. We spend a lot of time also in sampling techniques, really high volume data. Um, so parallel incremental learning. I actually just released a big open source uh, machine learning toolkit. Uh, the, the URL is there. Uh, that massively paralyzes incremental learning techniques from streams. Uh, so for things like the, the Higgs boson data set, we're able to paralyze the training of that activity and get it down from uh, what had been a best in class 39 hours for, uh, for existing systems down to about eight minutes for training with only about a 1% loss in accuracy. So we spent a lot of time just focused on how to do sampling uh, and, uh, and extracting uh, good training data sets uh, from a high volume, uh, high volume stream. The second is um, doing some reasoning, doing some analysis or inference over those extracted features. Uh, so a family of, of, of streaming machine learning techniques. Our challenge here is not to pick a model that we like and say, hey, we're Bayesians, uh, or we like convolutional neural nets, but rather say, we're going to need a whole family of, of ultimately probably hundreds of, of, uh, of different statistical inference techniques uh, and machine learning techniques uh, that we're going to have to learn how to dynamically recombine. They're not always going to perform well. Our challenge is to build a system that can recognize when they perform well and when they perform poorly and combine them in, uh, in appropriate ways for a data stream or for a task. Uh, so a lot of this work has focused on testing combinations of classifiers systematically. So uh, in this example in the upper left, we were, we're working just with a, a small set of, of, uh, of four streaming classifiers, naive bays, neural nets, some classification decision trees, um, and uh, paying attention to their performance over time as, as we combined their output in different ways so that we could learn uh, which data sets and which kinds of tasks they tend to perform optimally at. We also pay attention to when those models start to perform poorly, because that tells us if our, if, our, if our challenge with data analysis is that the world is constantly changing underneath our data, uh, paying attention to when our models no longer work is a good way of also telling that maybe the world has changed. Uh, so a lot of what we do over top of uh, uh, these ensemble modeling approaches is pay attention to model performance and flag for users when models aren't performing the way they used to for the same task and, uh, and data input. The second challenge is to integrate symbolic reasoning into the statistical inference or machine learning sort of techniques. So one great uh, advance that, uh, that, that we, uh, a, few, a few folks at the lab have sort of seized on is that symbolic reasoning is, uh, is sort of great uh, description logics and, and so on are, are, are really great for enforcing rules about the world. There are things that we can encode in description logics uh, that are, are basically rules about the domains in which we work. Um, 
rules that are otherwise really difficult to encode in, say, a machine learning algorithm. Uh, so our challenge here is, 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 is twofold. One is to think about how do you do symbolic reasoning in a streaming context? Uh, most, uh, most description logic tools, a lot of AI tools, are designed to operate over, um, over static data. Uh, when you operate, when you do uh, symbolic inference over streams, you have to do something that we've never had to think about before, which is how do I know what to forget? I'm going to start to, the symbolic reasoning basically is going to be collecting a set of facts and reasoning over those facts. If I make the assumption that I can't possibly store every fact ever created in perpetuity, I'm going to have to make decisions about what to save, what might be useful later on, uh, and, and what, to, uh, what to evict. So a lot of early work in this domain has, uh, has gone into the problem of cache eviction. How do, we, how do we remember, or how do we, we figure out what's worth remembering? And again, the human brain does this cache eviction problem really elegantly. Uh, you know, the, the canonical example is in your drive to work, you remember the stuff that, 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 uh, that was relevant to your commute and all the weird stuff that happened on the side of the road probably, uh, probably didn't persist. Uh, so we're trying to build uh, a cache eviction model for a reasoning system that, that mimics that same human capacity. Uh, but the cool thing here is that symbolic reasoners can have some veto power over hypotheses. A machine learning algorithm can be generating all of these, these candidate, uh, candidate stories, like Toyota is an appliance company, uh, and a symbolic reasoner can embed some facts and, and essentially say, no, that's not possible, based on these properties of the world. Uh, so we've learned we can get uh, really, really high accuracy for a lot of the domains we've been working in um, through uh, this combination of, uh, of, of symbolic and statistical, uh, statistical reasoning. Uh, we're starting to combine all of those now into knowledge graphs. So we have all of these reasoning algorithms constantly running over data, uh, and the challenge is to build a, build a representation of, of a domain, build a representation of the world from that data. Um, so all of that work now feeds into, uh, feeds into a big evolving knowledge graph. And um, knowledge graphs are commonly used in the search space. Google uses them massively. Uh, Wikipedia uses them a bit for, uh, for solving search problems. Uh, the nice thing we can do with knowledge graphs in a dynamic context is do uh, truth updating, truth maintenance. The world constantly changes, so things that were true yesterday may not be true today. Uh, and so um, we're, as we insert candidate relationships, like Toyota is an appliance company, uh, into the knowledge graph, we have other data that we can use to, uh, to validate the, uh, the, the, the bushy and truthiness of that, uh, of that statement. Um, and essentially decide whether or not we're going to admit a new fact into, uh, into that knowledge graph. Uh, and then I'm going to spend a little bit more time here, and the last area to focus on is the, the human in the loop piece of, of this problem. So, so imagine that uh, we're successful in five years and we're building these sort of reasoning systems, building a system uh, like in that initial demonstration that's, that's describing hypotheses from data. How are we telling you as a human analyst what those hypotheses are? Uh, so we're solving some core challenges here and how to communicate the output of machine insight. Um, how do we describe model provenance? How do we help you retrain a model? But in particular, uh, how do we describe the structure of, of, uh, of emerging knowledge? And can you detect when behaviors uh, in the underlying data change? And can you explain uh, what, those, what those changes are? Um, so we're doing this by experimenting with different kinds of abstractions. And streaming inference, abstractions really matter, right? And so wayfinding is a typical human streaming inference sort of problem. When you're doing wayfinding, your challenge is to get from A to B. You're constantly evaluating whether or not you're actually getting closer. You're making some real-time decisions. Um, and so in the, in the case of the Washington DC metro, and most metro systems use the same kind of abstractions, we typically do, we solve the streaming problem this way, with, with an abstraction that, uh, that helps us uh, make some very simple decisions versus a more accurate geographic representation on, on, the, on the right. Uh, so we're using the same sort of uh, analysis of various abstractions to look at how we display uh, emerging hypotheses to people. So we can display the output of classifiers, for instance, as, uh, as likely probabilities. So these can be lines of business, or these can be substances that we're observing in a, um, in a bioreactor. Uh, and, and one of the things we need to communicate to people in real time is what's going on uh, in, that, uh, in that trafficking network or in that bioreactor. So experimenting with a whole family of different abstraction techniques that we can use to test how efficiently how accurately people can make sense of, uh, of the phenomena. Uh, and so some of these experiments are actually just going on now, and I think, I can't recall, I think not this year's VAST, but we've got a workshop paper coming out uh, in the summer that, that, that shares the results of some of the initial user studies uh, on, this, uh, on this work. Um, so where I'll spend a, a bit more time, though, is the cool part. And this is actually stuff that uh, Alex Endert started a, a bit when he was with us, and we still work uh, a fair bit with, with you on and, and with others, which is really thinking deeply about this problem of embedding uh, humans into that process. So now we've, we've built uh, streaming uh, uh, 
uh, data extraction systems, we're extracting and sampling features from data, we're building some machine learning algorithms and symbolic reasoning algorithms that can start to find patterns in those, and we have maybe a candidate way of expressing those patterns through those visual abstractions, uh, expressing what those hypotheses might look like to people. Um, the challenge is, again, all of that good world knowledge is in people's heads is still something that we need to get out of their heads so we can continually tune and refine these, uh, these classifiers. The traditional way that you get world knowledge out of people's heads is the is the what we kind of affectionately call the Bogsat method. It's a bunch of bunch of guys and gals sitting around a table. I'm going to build an ontology. I find a bunch of experts. We get around the table. We sit in front of a whiteboard. We we structure our knowledge, uh, and and we're done. And the problem with that is uh, they're typically it's slow. It's expensive. Uh, most people don't like to do it. It's brittle uh, because it typically um, doesn't accommodate changes in the variety that we see in the real world. Uh, and often it's what we report as sort of textbook knowledge. It's not what actually happens in practice. So our challenge is to move away from that box set method and think about what we can get from all the click streams that come off of interactive analysis tools to see if we can get, uh, uh, if not a more accurate, at least a more continuous and more useful uh, expression of, uh, of human domain knowledge. Uh, so we did an initial user study to, uh, to evaluate the effects of, uh, of embedding people in a streaming environment on their sense-making process. And it's actually some work that uh, Alex collaborated on with, uh, with a few folks at, uh, at PNNL. Uh, so this is going back from those strategic surprise use cases where we're, we've got data continually flowing in from, uh, from an intelligence system in this case. Uh, and our challenge is to figure out what changes when I put an analyst in this streaming case. In the real world, you don't get all the data at the end of the, of the incident. You constantly get it. The data are never done. Uh, so we're not going to have this artificial discretization. Uh, we're going to embed people in that streaming, uh, streaming use case. And our control case will be you get all the data uh, at one time and you're doing a forensic analysis. Uh, this, is actually, this is actually vast, vast challenge data from a couple of, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I think Alex actually helped, helped uh, run this user study over, uh, over the summer. Uh, so we paid attention to, uh, to things like um, we built a, a simple clustering interface uh, to help people uh, manipulate these uh, in this case, documents, uh, pay attention to the kinds of interactions they had. Did they get and read a document, search activities, moving documents between groups, repositioning groups, and so on. Um, and we had two sets of users. We had a, oops, we had a set of users who uh, interacted with, uh, with, with uh, static data, got the data all at once, and one big tranche. Uh, and we had a set of users who, who worked in a streaming situation and got the data as, it, as if it had been played in, uh, in real time. And then paid attention to uh, the sense-making process and how people actually manipulated data, and also to what we could learn about, uh, about the world from, uh, from how they manipulated that data. This is one of the streaming users, uh, and they've started to create some, uh, some clusters of those, uh, of those documents, other sort of label clusters. Um, and because they're working in a streaming environment, you're going to start to see them organize the data in a way that's going to prepare them for, for receiving the next increment of, uh, of data. Uh, in this particular example, uh, what we find is users often are trying to organize a workspace in a way that, that uh, helps them reason uh, over a stream, that helps them accommodate the temporality in the, in the underlying data. So this is one example of, uh, of, of what users did in this, in this uh, particular task. And um, so what we find on the, the right-hand side here, we just take a, um, start paying attention to all the interaction events that, uh, that users uh, performed uh, in the static case and in the streaming case, um, and discovered that uh, in the streaming case, users much more intensively organize their documents in preparation for new data arriving, because they know they're going to be forced to put some new information in context. Uh, and they also more systematically uh, consume those new documents and integrate them um, into groups. So in these, uh, in these charts, this, these are users who worked on, on static data, these on streaming data. Uh, the label's a little hard to read, but one of the key things that pops out is the, the blue and orange dots here. And I think blue is adding a document to a group and orange is rearranging it. I might have those reversed. But you see this pattern of, of users systematically moving between those two modes uh, in, uh, in their streaming analysis in a way that we don't quite see in the static analysis. Static analysis is a little bit more linear, but we're working toward an end. And you can get away with that in a static case when you know that your, your world is not going to be shattered by new information. The model you're building can persist and it can, um, uh, you can use it essentially as a, as a set of landmarks that you'll use to, to, uh, to make sense of the world. In the streaming case, you've kind of constantly got to be prepared to accommodate change and accommodate new observations. Um, so we see a very different sort of sense-making behavior in, um, in the streaming case from the static case. This is starting to, starting to guide us in some design principles for how you actually build visualization tools to accommodate streaming, uh, streaming analysis. Um, the last piece of this, then, is to recognize that people aren't perfect. People aren't oracular. I've got users who are organizing documents. Some of them might be better at this task than others. Some of them might be smarter than others. Some of them might know more about the domain than others. Um, 
we're, we're instrumenting all of their actions and we're using uh, patterns in their interactions to tune underlying classifiers, to uh, remove documents from classes or to improve uh, the parameterization of a class. Um, but we don't want to do that equally for all users. We recognize that users are often cognitively depleted, they're biased, they have error. So the last piece of this workflow for us, we got kind of all the way to the end, we built this sort of simple system over the last year um, to take streaming data, to make hypotheses over it, to present those in that simple example I gave you at the beginning of its Toyota trade in cars or appliances, or is this substance is in, the, is in the reactor or isn't, and recognize that all the things we're learning from people in order to make those assumptions weren't necessarily valid. Um, a, human, uh, a human system is only effective as, as the humans in it. So how do we predict when people are about to fail? Predict when people are giving bad information back to the system. Uh, we want to be able to predict human performance in real time and tune our, uh, our classifiers in response to that. So um, we started to do some experimentation for uh, how well we can, we can model uh, human performance. We did this initially in two domains. We did it in gaming and we did it in standardized tests. And the reason we picked those domains is that they're explicitly scored, so we know whether you're good at it or not. Uh, and we actually get pretty good clickstream uh, data off of those. So in the gaming case, we've got about uh, 50,000 uh, interaction logs from 50,000 top uh, Halo Reach players. Um, and uh, these people have played, I think, 2,000 person years of, uh, of Halo Reach over the last, uh, the last few months. Uh, and Halo is a nice exemplar for doing this in the visualization world because it's an open world environment. There's lots of stuff I can do. It's not like that Amazon use case where I bought the thing I didn't. It's not a binary, uh, a binary success measure. Uh, so we can correlate all of the human activity that goes on in the game with ultimate scores. And the same with taking standardized tests uh, online. We have lots of information, not just about how well a student performed, um, but uh, when they took breaks, how long it took them to solve a particular question. And we're trying to get at some of these underlying issues of human performance so that we can start to weight all that feedback back into our reasoning systems. Um, so we discover as people get tired, they get worse at their work, which isn't really surprising, but we're trying to actually quantify this and model it on a user-by-user -user basis. So in the case of video games, we did some early experiments where, where if you look at the time between, uh, excuse me, the time before a break, um, human performance gets really, really bad. You get tired and you start to make more mistakes. This is, uh, in, in, in Halo terms, this is suicides per kill. Essentially, how many times you died versus uh, per, per, per kill that you made in the game. Uh, and there's a point at which the system should have said you should take a break now, hit pause, or I'm gonna hit pause for you because you're about to get uh, a lot worse at the game. You also get a lot more impulsive. So strategies in the game start to vary a lot more. Entropy in the strategy selection process increases with time uh, before a break. Um, people get slower. In the standardized testing case, it took you a lot longer to answer a question the more tired you were. Uh, and there's some learning factors that we can build in standardized tests because you pay attention to how people answer similar questions and whether they're able actually learning during the course of the test. Uh, and your learning speed uh, decreases. The probability of learning decreases in time before break. So simple things just like how tired you are actually define a lot of your success in these complex analytic tasks. So we kind of recognize that we're, we're trying to build this magical human computer system and we got the computer tiredness part figured out because we have reliable UPS system, we've got all the power we need in our data center, we haven't figured out the human tiredness part of the problem. So the last piece of all this research comes down to making these sort of streaming go, no-go decisions. Do so I like, you're this, you're, this, you're this human giving me feedback back into my automated reasoning system, but I like what you're telling me or not. Um, so the initial implementation of this is basically streaming what we call go, no-go decisions. I mean, a binary decision. I'm going to listen to you or I'm not going to listen to you. Uh, we actually replayed this, uh, this analysis with the Halo data that we had. Uh, the blue line here, these are the number of games people played in succession. Uh, this is a performance score. The blue line here is the observed performance um, for a, for a sample of users. Actually, this is, this is for one particular user. Um, and the various colored lines here are what our estimate of their score would have been had they uh, abided by one of these alternate strategies that the system could propose. Uh, some, some naive strategies like take a break every end games, um, or make some tr uh, try to make some more accurate predictions about your performance because we can detect some of those trend lines in impulsivity uh, or in impaired learning as time goes on. Use some of those metrics to make a streaming decision. If our prediction is that you're gonna make some bad performance decisions we're gonna make a we're gonna make a no-go decision. We're gonna we're gonna not include the feedback that you provide in the system into our reasoning system or into our reasoning process. So um, we've started doing some of this work with uh, molecular biologists who study the goop in these reactors because one of their jobs is to sort of make a determination by seeing the thing that I'm supposed to see. Uh, and we learn that, that they're not always accurate in doing that. And the more tired they are, the more impulsive they are, frequently the more error there is in their estimates. And so we're trying to counter some of that bias uh, in this work. I'm going to skip a little bit of just how we build this. This all now exists. It's all been pushed out to the Amazon cloud. We actually run this as a big elastic cloud service that can make these sort of uh, streaming hypotheses over, uh, over live, 
live data. Um, so I just want to wrap up in the next minute or so with, with some ideas about where we can go from here, where we can collaborate. Uh, a couple of open AIM research topics that we'd love for, for uh, more, more participation with Georgia Tech from. Uh, one is just around this, this core issue of, uh, of hypothesis characterization. What do, we act, what do hypotheses look like? I know how to visualize data. Not so sure about how I visualize stories. Uh, the second is building uh, much more comprehensive user models. Uh, right now, a lot of the, the simple models that we're using to take user feedback into these automated systems are just based on uh, things like those cognitive depletion models. Just are you doing well at this task? Are you doing poorly? But actually, some richer task models to understand what kind of task you're trying to perform and what sort of uh, scaffolding or support uh, our system provides to that sort of task. Um, solving the human-machine feedback problem. Alex and I have actually talked a fair bit about this this morning. Um, think about all of the different ways that we can leverage clickstream data off of interactive tools to infer something about, uh, about human behavior uh, and to get beyond the problem of just labeling. We're good at labeling. The, net, the Netflix micro-genres is basically having people watch hundreds of thousands of movies and, and label them. Uh, we'd like to get at some more underlying semantic uh, uh, coherence. Um, and the last around, some improved streaming summarization techniques. Uh, there's also an open opportunity here to think about metrics. How are we measuring the success of AIM systems? So we have a family of metrics that we're using to assess how accurately our reasoning system performs, which is, which is basically about performing insight faster than a human system or a machine system alone. So we do a lot of user testing. We find the smartest person we can let's say one of these compound identification tasks. Uh, for, for the bioreactor example, it's Nancy. We have a Nancy as a unit of measurement. And our goal is to get a, a 10x, 100x improvement in, uh, in, in uh, 10x Nancys, which is basically performing act more accurately and more quickly than our, our best human can. Uh, so we're building an insight metric, which is basically a, a combination of, of, uh, uh, of three sub-measures. One is accuracy, uh, which is basically an F1 measure, precision recall measure. Um, uh, the second is around utility. We realize we can tell you lots of, uh, lots of true things and lots of true things quickly, but not all of those are going to be particularly useful to you. In fact, machine learning algorithms, all these symbolic reasoners, are particularly good at telling you facts that aren't particularly useful. Toyota's a car company. Putin's the president of Russia. Uh, I need more analytically useful facts, more surprising things. So usefulness, utility is a key part of this. Uh, and lastly, throughput. Uh, that these systems will generate uh, judgments at rates that approximate that of the, uh, the underlying phenomenon. And we're testing all this against best of breed static systems so that we can we at least know how good we can get at our inference if we had all the data uh, in one single store at once. Uh, so this at a very high level is a sort of big, big bet that we're making in streaming analytics. Um, each of these areas has a lot of sub-projects going on. I'd love to talk to you more about, about any of the specifics if there are areas you'd like to get engaged. In terms of specific ways to get engaged, there are lots of opportunities at the lab, uh, internships, postdocs, um, jobs. Uh, we're always, uh, always hiring uh, computer scientists, visualization researchers, machine learning folks. Uh, we, we, we go about 10% a year in this area just because of the volume of, uh, of projects. Um, lots of exercises going on at the lab. We do all, all sorts of um, uh, capture the flag activities, um, and other uh, kind of collaborative learning exercises to kind of get us all on the same page around uh, some of these emerging areas of, uh, of scientific discovery and, uh, and opportunities for us. So um, at a high level, that's, uh, that's where we're headed in um, linking human and machine reasoning for, uh, for data streams. Uh, I'd love to talk with you guys more about ideas that you have, uh, where some of your own research might fit into this sort of model. And certainly, if you'd like to come spend some time at the lab uh, exploring some of these problems with us, uh, I'd love to have that conversation, too. So thanks for your time, and hopefully we have a few minutes for questions. Questions? I was interested in your HALO studies. That would tend to be very male. Did you try to do anything balanced in yeah. certain age groups, probably, yeah, yeah. too? So. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you're, you're right. It's not, uh, it's not uh, a representative demographic. And, and realistically, what we learned from HALO won't necessarily apply to uh, one of our biological use cases just because, yeah, the demographics are very different, the experience is very different. We were simply interested in that case in determining was it even possible to find some correlations between cognitive state and performance. Um, and, we, and we picked that one just because we had some great performance measures. Uh, we don't have such good performance measures in other domains. Like, we look at scientists and we're kind of like, how do we know if you're actually a good scientist or not? Um, so we picked things that we could explicitly score, but I think you're right. I think a next step would be to try to, um, uh, try to pick other domains and see if you look at different demographics or different problems, if, if, if some of the correlations we see in HALO actually persist in, in other, other data sets. So kind of following off that, um, you noticed a, a, a decline in accuracy over time for each session, whether or not there were field breaks. Given that the uh, average work day is about eight hours, uh, roughly how much rest time do you need to actually determine useful 
performance. So the, the question was, how much rest time do you need before you return to useful performance, given the average workday is eight hours? Let's, let's assume that the answer is less than eight hours. <laughs> um, and I think it's going to vary by task, uh, and it may vary by person. Um, in the Halo case, I think there we were, we were suggesting a break of 10 minutes, and 10 minutes seemed to work. Uh, but I think it's going to, it probably will be very task dependent, so maybe doing some better studies across tasks to see if that, uh, if that break duration changes. Um, they're, they're, it probably is asymptotic, no, no matter what you're working on, at a certain point you probably break long enough. A day, a week, whatever. Awesome. Let's thank right. Bill again. Thanks a lot.